So let's start with the most basic way of interpreting the ECG. Um, the first thing you do is you have to check the voltage calibration. What's this about? This is about the amplification of the image that the ECG machine is going. Sometimes with arrhythmias, we want to enlarge the complexes, so we will double the, the amplification of the image. But usually, for almost all routine ECGs, the calibration is so-called 10 um, millimeters. That's 10 little boxes, and we'll show you examples of that. And it's always good to check that to begin with, because if they had been using the machine at a higher amplification, the complexes are going to look bizarre. They're going to be big and so forth, and you might make a mistake in reading. So first, make sure that, that the calibration is correct. Usually the technician takes care of that. that uh, but it's, there's a little box that shows you the calibration is OK. And I'll point that out later. The next thing is to determine the rhythm. And how do you do that? You're looking for P waves followed by QRSs. In other words, the normal progression. Remember, starting up with the sinus node, atrial depolarization, P wave, QRS, ventricular depolarization, T wave resetting. Once you know what the rhythm is, in other words, is this a normal sinus rhythm or is it not normal sinus rhythm but, a, but an arrhythmia? And we're going to have whole lectures about the kinds of abnormal electrical events that can occur when it's not sinus rhythm. Um, you then calculate the heart rate, which is, a, there's a normals there, and I'm going to be going over the normals as we go along. Um, you then do the timing intervals. What's the PR interval from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS? What's the QRS duration? That's the period of ventricular depolarization. And then how long does it take for the whole uh, contraction and resetting of the ventricle from the Q wave to the end of the T wave? We would then determine the electrical axis. In other words, uh, what is the main vector force of the electrical depolarization wave? What direction is it going in? Um, and there's a certain normal area for that. Um, and for example, if you have abnormalities of, of the ventricular mass, uh, you can get abnormal uh, vectors, uh, abnormal uh, electrical vectors. Um, we want to look at the P wave morphology to see if it's normal. We look at its voltage and its shape uh, because certain abnormalities of P wave uh, morphology can occur with certain diseases. We want to do the same for the QRS morphology. Again, certain diseases, um, and for example, heart blocks, things that can lead to pacemakers, will change the morphology of the QRS. We'll then look at the ST segment and the T wave morphology. Ischemia, lack of blood flow in the heart that can lead to angina or heart uh, attacks, changes the ST segment and T wave morphology. And if we're lucky enough to have an earlier baseline EKG, we compare it to see, hey, have there been changes? Is something going on here that's something acute? So let's start. Here is a normal ECG. Notice. In the upper left corner, there is a little green box. That's the standard. And that standard is, if you count the little tiny boxes, 10 little boxes. Each one of the big boxes has five smaller boxes. So there'll be two of the big boxes, um, which constitute 10 small boxes. Each one of those boxes is one millimeter and corresponds to one millivolt of electrical activity. Um, so uh, again, uh, this is the standard on all ECG machines. Uh, and if you had set the standard to half, then of course it would be each uh, uh, one of those little boxes uh, would be uh, less uh, uh, voltage. If you doubled it, they would be um, more voltage. But usually, again, almost all EKGs use this green box of the 10 standard. You'll notice how the leads are placed here. On the left-hand side, there's lead 1, 2, and 3. Remember, 0 degree, plus 60, plus 120. The next three leads, AVR, L, and F. AVR, plus 210. AVL, minus 30. AVF, plus 90. And then come the precordial leads, the ones that are sticking through the heart like, like needles in a sagittal plane. V1, V2, V3, 4, 5, and 6. And this is a normal ECG. Notice there's a P wave in front of each QRS. The QRSs are nice and narrow. There's a nice T wave upright and, and not way prolonged after each QRS. Um, this is sinus rhythm, normal sinus rhythm that, that's set off by the sinus node, passes normally through the heart. There's no evidence here of ischemia or heart attack or, or hypertrophy of the heart muscle.
as I said, you'll notice that there's sinus rhythm. In the green box, you'll see that each QRS is preceded by a P wave. The, atri the atrium depolarizes before the ventricle. All the P waves are followed by a QRS. There's no blockage of the beat as it goes down through the heart. Each QRS is preceded by a P, and the P's are all identical. They're upright in leads 2 and AVF, um, and they're nice and narrow. They're not prolonged. Um, if any of the comments just made the answer was no, then you're talking about an arrhythmia. And as I said, we're going to have whole lectures on the arrhythmias later. So right now we're just worrying about the normal. Also, uh, you notice how nicely uh, the QRSs progress. Uh, in fact, that whole strip along the bottom, even though they're different leads, it's continuous. So you're actually seeing one set of P waves after another. In order to um, obtain the heart rate, you count the number of big boxes between two QRSs and you divide by 300. So if there were two big boxes between the two QRSs, that would be 2 into 300 or 150. If there were three big boxes in between a QRS, that would be a rate of 100, 3 into 300. If there were four boxes in between the two QRSs, that would be 75. 4 into 300 is 75. You can also do it by counting the number of QRSs in three seconds. Remember, the ECG is moving at a certain rate. You can calculate a, a, a number of seconds and then multiply by 20. But usually what we do is we use the rule of 300 mentioned before. It's important to note uh, that the normal heartbeat is 60 to 100 beats per minute. So now we have the heart rate. By the way, the computer's almost always right on the heart rate. Um, again, let's talk about the intervals. So a normal PR interval is 0.2 seconds to 0.20 seconds. That's three little boxes to five little boxes, right? You remember there's five little boxes within the big, bigger box. So the normal PR interval from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS is somewhere between three and five little boxes, 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. The normal QRS interval is less than 0.1, that's two and a half little boxes. And the normal QT, which is corrected for heart rate in a formula, is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.46 seconds. Remember the QT from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the T wave. Um, Remember, each small box is 0.04 seconds, so a large box is five times 0.04 seconds or 0.20 seconds, and there are five small boxes in each large box, as I've said before. Again, what about the axis? Well, there's a general rule that most med students use, and that is if the QRS is upright and leads one and two, it's a normal axis. You can actually calculate the axis because the axis is perpendicular to any lead where the R and the S, or the upstroke and the downstroke, are equal. In this example, lead three. You see that pretty much the amount above the line and below the line is about the same. So the axis is going to be 90 degrees from lead three. So 90 degrees plus 120, lead three is 120, remember that's 210. And that would be, in other words, um, a, uh, the axis would be towards AVR, or minus 90 from 120 would be 30. That would be somewhere near lead, near lead 2, which is plus 60. Well, you can see, how do we tell? Where is the maximum R wave? Well, the maximum R wave is around lead 2. It's, there's no upright R wave in AVR, so therefore the axis is actually uh, something like a, a plus 30. Um, so again, the, the rule of thumb is you look to see where the, the amount of voltage up and down is equal. It's 90, the axis is 90 degrees from that. Then you look for the lead with the maximum R wave. That's the direction because you could go this way on the 90 degrees or you could go that way. What tells you which way you go is where's the maximum R wave. In this one, it's lead two. And uh, again, normal axis is between minus 30 and plus 90. And if the axis is not between plus, uh, minus 30 and plus 90, then it's an axis deviation. If it goes more minus, that's so-called left axis deviation. If it goes more plus than 90, it's called right axis deviation. And we'll talk about how that's used in reading various electrocardiographic diagnoses. 
So again, just to reiterate, the axis for the mean frontal plane electrical vector of the heart is near the limb lead with the tallest R wave and perpendicular to the lead where the size of the upward deflection and the downward deflection are equal. Remember, the upward deflection is called an R wave, the downward deflection is called an S wave. So let's take a look at the P wave itself. The normal P wave is going to be three little boxes or less in duration. Remember that the PR interval, that's the duration from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS, is going to be less than five little boxes. But the length of the P wave itself should be only three little boxes. And it should be upright in lead one and two and a negative deflection of less than one box wide or one box deep in V1. If the P wave in lead V1 is more negative than one box and wider than one box, that suggests that the atrium, is, the left atrium is enlarged, so-called left atrial enlargement. If the box is pointed and higher than two millimeters, then, uh, and usually wider than two, then that defines right atrial enlargement. Now, these numbers are not anatomically perfect. The echo and the MRI and so forth will be more perfect, but they carry prognostic information. They're very important because when they appear, it really means that there's quite significant either left atrial dilatation or right atrial dilatation. Let's look at the R wave now. The normal R wave should transit in the precordial lead. Starting with lead V1, there should be a very small R wave. And then it gets a little bigger in V2. And somewhere between V3 and V4, it, you have a dominant R wave with not much S wave. And then it progresses out to V6 uh, with usually the maximum R wave somewhere in V4, 5, and 6 with the transition from more negative to positive somewhere around V3 or V4. Small cues, that is initial downward deflections of less than one little box um, can occur, um, but uh, that they are never longer than one box. If they're wider than one box, it suggests that there's been damage uh, to the myocardium. And uh, the voltage should be within a normal range. Also, the ST segment should be isoelectric, that is, it should be flat. Um, you can have a little bit of depression, um, but if it's substantially depressed more than a tiny amount, it suggests a number of things. Let's look at what it suggests. If there's a sort of curved sagging of the ST segment, as in this example, that means the patient is usually taking digitalis. Digitalis has that effect. If there's ischemia or lack of blood flow, you see a squared off flattening of the ST segment. We see that with positive exercise tests, and we see that when patients come in and, and have a so-called non-ST elevation myocardial infarct, and we'll talk more about those definitions later. Um, and then in hypokalemia, where the potassium is low, you may see a mildly downsloping ST segment. The T wave is often flattened, and as I mentioned before, you may see a little additional wave after the T wave, the U wave. Again, here's the normal EKG. Look at the ST segments here. They're all fine. They're not depressed. They're not elevated. They're in exactly the right sequence. <music>